So I, I went to L.A., um, and it's amazing how here in this area, we're used to having the king of basketball. And so he's the king here because he bought us a championship that we ain't had in a very, very long time. And so even though he's not here, we still reverence him as if he still is. He came for a game not too long ago and the front page of the paper said, homecoming king. And everybody celebrates this basketball phenomena. Now, me and his relationship has been struggling over the years, but we've patched things up. And, and so it's amazing because, but when you went to LA, you didn't see nothing about no king there. Not a billboard, not a sign, not where I was. Now they may be there, but there was not a presence of that basketball king. And it's so amazing how we have this, this, this inner longing to crown somebody king. It just, we can't just celebrate everybody's giftings or everybody's skills or whatever. We have to determine who's the greatest. Who is the king? And so I almost started a fight in the 830 service. I'm going to chance it right here. Remember, we in church. But I am a sports household. You know, I, I raise boys and my husband's so sports center. Something sports is always going on in my house. And I promise you, at least twice or three times a week, this debate always comes up. Who's the king, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Okay. Oh, God. Uh, see, I told you I don't fight in here. Hold on, I'm going to give you a chance to speak on this. And so I have to take a poll. I took a poll in the first service. So how many say that Michael Jordan is the king? Woo! Oh, Lord. Okay. How many people say LeBron is the king? Oh. I told you. I, t I told you, I told you. Now, if I was in L.A., you know, they would have said Kobe. Now, how many say Kobe is the king? <laughs> see, see, this debate is a debate that probably will never be solved, but it takes so much of our time in this argument in the sports world, okay? If you're not in the sports world, just forgive me in my example this morning. But it is just always the topic, no matter what happens, it always comes down to who was the greatest. Now, I'll tell you my take on this, and don't hold me accountable. Don't lead a church over this or stop giving. And don't send me no email. One thing about the king, and you think about kingship, kingship is not just about ability, but it is about heart. Now y'all get ready to change your answers on me. So if I'm going to declare who's king, I have to look at the total person to see if they operate in kingly attributes. It has to be more than just on the basketball court. It, it has to be more than just assists and, and, and triple doubles and, and points and the highest score. It has to be well-rounded because a king is just not kingly in one area of their life. And so on that note, I would have to crown LeBron because of not only what he's done on the court, but what he's done in the lives of people off the court. And so when you think about it, he has the I Promise Foundation, he has, he has all of these things that are happening, I Promise, and then they have the, 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 the places they even have people, they can live there, they have a whole little uh, complex there. Then he has the I Promise program at Kent State. So not only do they finish school, they go into college and then the all-star game that was in Cleveland, they want enough money to pay for housing on Kent State's campus for those who receive the I Promise. I'm teaching good, ain't I? LeBron, this one is for you. And so our relationship has struggled throughout the years because you know the whole Miami thing, you know, I was heartbroken for a long time, but then he came back and he made it right. And then there was the whole L.A. thing. I didn't really trip about L.A. I just wanted him here because you always want to be in the presence of the king. And this debate is going to continue to happen. But can I tell you, this same debate was happening on the reason why we celebrate this Sunday. 
Today is Palm Sunday, as hopefully that you received your palm when you came in. And I want you to take it because we pay a lot for them. <laughs> Palms ain't cheap like they used to be. The price of inflation has just seen. We'll, we'll talk about that another Sunday. But it is Palm Sunday, and it was a, a, a day of Jesus making his triumphal entry. Now, it's amazing how much hoopla was happening because he was coming to die. And the same people that cried Hosanna on today will be the same people on Friday crying crucify him. But on today, that was a spoiler alert, we, we celebrate Palm Sunday because in Matthew 21, it says, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus is coming in and they done made way. They have laid their, their coats down and they're waving their palms and crying Hosanna because they recognized his kingship. But the fourth verse, understand this. We have to go back a little bit. It says this, now this took place that what spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. Now let's just kind of rewind a little bit because back in the Old Testament, once the children of Israel were delivered from the hands of the Egyptians, the purpose was for the priest and the prophet to lead them. But the people called for a king. The people, we always want to call for a ruler or who is the best. And so they called for the king. You can go all through the Old Testament, all kind of kings. It was, it was crooked kings, wicked kings, good kings, all these kings. But they were promised one true king who would be the Messiah. He would be the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. And so this prophecy here, uh, uh, it's it, it said in the Old Testament that your king is coming, but understand what he looks like and how he will come. So fast forward to Palm Sunday when Jesus was entering in, they could not handle the fact that he didn't look like a king. See, it would be like LeBron pulling up in a Ford Focus. You just don't, you don't expect to see LeBron in a Ford Focus because he's kingly. He should have kingly provision. Kings are about pomp and circumstance and they are all about uh, entourages and gold and chariots. But yet, here comes Jesus. Who is this king? He is the rightful king the victorious king and the gentle king. Now, let, let's, let's talk about that rightful king so that we can understand that he was mounted on a purebred coat presenting himself as Israel's promised king. Now, the problem with that is if you don't know the story, before he came into the city, he sent two disciples out. He said, go into the city, there is a coat tied to a stake. He said, I want you to go and untie that coat. And when they ask you, why are you untying the coat? Tell them the master has need of it. Can I do a sidebar right here? Some of us were delivered out of situations and don't even know why, but it was because the master had need. He let you be tied up in your stuff as long as you were, but when he had need of you, he loosed you so that he can put his glory on you. Well, how did you come free from addiction? Well, how you been in that relationship all that time and then all of a sudden you just walked free because the master. <laughs> I ain't even supposed to go there today. The master has need 
of you. And they took the donkey and they brought him to Jesus and Jesus rode in. And while some were confused, there were those who recognized this connection. They remembered what their mama had taught them about scripture because we don't believe scripture no more these days. We, we trying to make it more popular. They were able to cross-reference back to say that Messiah was coming in on a colt. He was riding in on a donkey. And then the people cried, Hosanna to the son of David. Acclaiming Jesus to be their rightful king so much to the point that they threw down their garments to make a carpet for his royal procession. So now while we may not see Jesus physically on the donkey, he's riding in our lives on today. He is coming to remind us of the victory that he is going to have. And if we pay attention, what we should be doing is recognize his sovereignty by laying out our hearts before him. Throwing down our wills in absolute surrender. And asking Jesus to govern everything we think, say, and do. See, I know we want to wave our palms in the sanctuary, but he, be, he would be more pleased with your laying down of your heart. And surrendering your will. It's amazing to me how we can confess with our mouths and believe in our heart, believe in our heart but we can't let him rule over our lives. Hallelujah. I'm trying to stay on time. I got to practice for next week. I got so much to say about that. When we cry Hosanna today, we are laying down our hearts. He is our rightful king. And there is no argument about that. Now we move to the victorious king. Understand, where my palm? You got your palm? Right? Wave your palm in the air. I want to see it. I told you we paid a lot for him. We're going to get some work out of him today. So our palms are an ancient symbol of victory. So what they were saying was we recognize our victorious king even though he hadn't even fought the battle yet. We deemed him victorious. And so he was riding through and they began to wave the palm. But here's the kicker. They cried Hosanna. But Hosanna is, it's a prayer. It's not a praise. Hosanna is a cry for help. What they were saying was, save me. Help me. That just tripped out your uh, Palm Sunday, didn't it? We think that we're just, oh, bless your name, Jesus. Uh-uh, no, no, it wasn't that. It was help me. You seem to be victorious. We recognize your victory. Now, I'm like the thief on the cross. Remember me. It's like the, the air traffic controllers. I need to get some attention over here because when I cry Hosanna, I cry help me. Save me. Help me. Save me, oh victorious one. Can you look out for a sister? Can you? While I'm on this tedious journey. Can, can, can you look? Just, just wave. Remember me. Lord, help me. Save me. I need you. I tried it my way. This thing ain't working out. The world is getting crazier by the God help. He is the victorious king and and, and understanding that the way to enter victory is to call on him for salvation. See, I roll with the winners. I learned that from the brown. So when I see victory, I want to roll with victory too. And as he rolls into the city on today, spiritually in my life, 
I'm rolling with the winner. And I'm saying, save me. Remember me. I'm in need. Remember, I need your help. And then that brings us to the, my last point this morning. The scripture says he's a gentle king. Now Jesus comes to greet his subjects not with pomp and circumstances, but with all humility and meekness. See, the donkey represented humility. He treats us as members of his own family. And not only that, but he's the universal king for all people everywhere. See, the Jews thought he was just coming to be their Messiah. But he was coming to be the Messiah of the world. Now understand his meekness, which is just power under control. It wasn't that he was weak. See, he is a mighty and awesome potentate. Strong and fierce enough to crush all his enemies. But yet he is tender and loving and peaceful to everyone who trusts in him he could have come down it wasn't the nails that held him he took all the power that he had and he humbled himself to be kind and gentle to you Our gentle king, if we are saved by such a gentle king, then we should serve him with all gentleness. Our lives should be living demonstrations of the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Do you serve a ruler who rides a high horse? <laughs> or the gentle king who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey? The powerful thing about a king is his subjects usually follow suit. There's no place for you to ride in on a high horse as if you were worthy for such a sacrifice. But that you humble yourself. I had to fall off my horse as Saul. Some of us had to be knocked off our horse. But it was not to kill you, but to you adopt a different mode of transportation. <laughs> There's a little story. I wasn't supposed to tell this today, but I'm going to end here. VeggieTales has a, 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 a cartoon about Palm Sunday. And they're explaining what happened on Palm Sunday. And they explained it through the eyes of the donkey. And it was this little donkey. And he was so excited. He had been chosen for Jesus to ride on. And when he was coming through the city, he was bowing and waving at people. And he thought the parade was for him. And he rode on through and he was waving and, and, and smiling and everything. And when it was over, him and his mother, they put him in a, in a special uh, 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 barn. And when he got up the next morning, he walked out and he was looking for all the praise and all of the hoopla. And he said, where are the people? Don't, don't they know that I'm here just like I was yesterday? His mother said, you foolish donkey. It was never about you. Don't be like the donkey. He chose you to set his glory upon, but it is never about you. We should mimic the king we serve. Philippians 4 says, let your gentleness be known 
to all men. When you ask the world about what a Christian is, gentleness is probably not one of the things that they would say. Judgmental, looking down on people. And that may not be you, but over these last few years, the church has got a real bad rap. But it is time for us to demonstrate the gentleness of our King. What kind of King do you serve? LeBron may be the king of basketball. Michael Jackson may have been the king of pop. But the Messiah is the king of glory. He's the king of all kings. As we move into Holy Week, I want you to start focusing on the cross. If you go with me, I will make this one of the most memorable Holy Weeks you have ever experienced because on Friday night we're going to come in and we're literally going to be at the foot of the cross I know we want to jump to Sunday and we want to celebrate and shout that he is risen but until you understand how he died for you you cannot understand his resurrection join me at the cross on Friday night It wasn't the nails that held him. It wasn't the authority of anyone else. But it was because he's the rightful, the victorious, and the gentle king. Lord God, we lift our hearts to you this morning in preparation of what's going to happen this week. As we acknowledge Holy Week, as we sober ourselves and focus on you, that we get everything that you have for us to understand the totality of what you have done for us. That we don't take it for granted and that we don't get up on our high horses like we deserved it. But that we continue to humble ourselves and we remember you are the King of glory. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on and give the Lord.